Hi, this is Benjamin Friedman, author of Scale, Reach Your Peak, founder and president of Build, Scale, Grow. And in my episode of the Business Growth Architect Show, I will talk about scaling despite fear and uncertainty. We'll get into the mindset, the skill set, and practical action set of things you can do to face the uncertainty before you. A spoiler alert, all of us have uncertainty all the time. So let's dig in and learn more. Welcome to the Business Growth Architect Show. I am Beata Chalet. I am the host. I want to welcome you to our globally top 10% ranked podcast, where you will hear from industry experts about the strategies that are working right now to unlock hidden opportunities in any market so that you can grow your authority and scale your impact. And now let's get started with the show. Welcome back. This is your host, Beate Chalette, to another episode of the Business Growth Architect. Today with me is Benjamin Friedman from the company Build, Scale and Grow. And I wrote it right down on my clapper. So I remember everything about you. Benjamin, welcome to the show. I'm so glad you're here. Beate, it's so great to be here. I love your story of perseverance and learning, and I'm excited to talk with you today. And that we will. So I want to just open the stage here today with a really big issue a lot of business owners, entrepreneurs, founders are having right now, and that is uncertainty. I want to talk to you today about how can we get control in uncertain times. When I say uncertainty to someone like you, who is a, you know, is in growth and scaling a fractional CFO, who really helps companies to get to that next level, and you hear the word uncertainty, What's your immediate response to that? So it's funny. I hear the word uncertainty and I think life. Uh, there's constantly <laughs> uncertainty in the market and the global economy with our team, with our investors, with our customers and other stakeholders. There's always going to be a lot of uncertainty, but let's unpack that further and see what uh, we can reveal to our audience. Exactly. So the things that I hear about uncertainty is that Right now, the uncertainty is primarily in the economic environment. Should I invest? Should I hold on to my cash? Should I get a line of credit? Should I lay people off preemptively? Should I expand? Other people talk about unlocking hidden opportunities in recessions and economic downturns. Where are they? So how do we help people to unravel these different pieces and or help them organize how to make sense of uncertainty? Now, this is great. And I'm going to go back to our original conversation on this and, and set the stage that let's talk about the mindset first, uh, the skill set second, and then the action set third, so that we're clear in the progression here. Because with uncertainty often comes anxiety. Uh, that's human nature. Uh, but I encourage founders and business leaders to really think about how to be proactive versus reactive. And I always start with the founder problem fit. What's the original reason that you got into business? What problem are you trying to solve? And then talk to me about your vision and your values, because all those different concepts are consistently certain, despite all the other noise happening around us. So let's dive into what is certain a little bit more. So you say the problem we are trying to solve. Do you think that this has shifted right now in this market that we're experiencing? Is it always shifting or is it not that once we are Starbucks and we have coffee that we always sell coffee? <laughs> no, it's definitely always shifting. Uh, do you Starbucks as an example? Uh, they started by selling coffee. Now they sell the coffee makers. Uh, they deliver when they said they would never do that, right? They were meant to be a, a second office for a lot of people. They have pivoted uh, in that example. And, and companies are meant to always think about ways to best serve uh, their customers so that they can continuously find new opportunities. The certainty lies in what value do you want to provide to your customers? How do you want to position yourself in the market? And how do you take advantage of various shifts as they're occurring while staying true to yourself and your customers? Yes, I think that the example of Starbucks actually is really good because is it just coffee? Because now it's tea and it is uh, iced drinks and it is matcha and it is all kinds of different things. So you say that the problem that I solve 
may originate with my original idea, but that idea has to adjust due to market conditions. Do you want to add anything to that? Yes, I think the consistency comes in what problem are you trying to solve? So for Starbucks, it was to get their products in as many hands as possible and have people experience the joys of drinking coffee and then other beverages. And they also wanted to create an environment that's conducive to people enjoying the experience. So even though they pivoted and started doing delivery, and even though they're selling many more items in their store that are not beverages, they're always coming back to their customer satisfaction. And if they're doing a gift card campaign, for example, they are always gauging their customer interest and making sure that the audience uh, for them is embracing their direction, uh, not going the other way. And we've seen them try different things. They used to do uh, CDs in Starbucks. That was very popular for about a minute. And then their customers said, no, I'm here to get a good cup of coffee, not to buy a CD. And of course, they shifted away from that. So the consistency is how they're identifying and working with their customers to grow their business. I remember that. I, I remember when I was standing there at Christmas and they had such good music. And then you okay. said, what is the music that you're playing? They said, oh, we happen to have the CD and you can buy it right now. And I did. It was all about taking the experience home until... The market changed and people said, no, I'm going to stream now on Spotify. What do I need to pick up a CD at, at Starbucks? And in this category, is that the mindset, the skill set, or the action set that we are in, that we were talking about earlier when we are figuring out what the solution is and we are adjusting that solution? So this category is the mindset. It's how are you going to approach any uncertainty that you face? And by the way, that's the ups and the downs. You know, we tend to think of uncertainty as a negative but there is uncertainty in all of a sudden you've uh, managed to find product market fit or service market fit and business is booming. Uh, there's uncertainty in you got a fundraise and you're bringing in millions of dollars to hire a new team or do product development. And there's a lot of considerations there. All that is uncertainty, but the idea is in your mindset, you're always reverting back to the, the problem you originally wanted to solve. And you're moving forward to thinking about how can I grow the business? How can I grow myself? That leads into a growth mindset of no matter what's happening around you, you're always trying to learn and do better and grow your business. I love that. Uh, combat the stagnation and uh, the myth of that there is a getting there. There is no getting there from what I understand, Benjamin. What shall you say? No, I, I totally agree. I think some people lay out ambitious plans of where they want to be in five years or 10 years, and that's fantastic. Uh, but for most business leaders and ourselves included, you want to think uh, a certain time period in the future, maybe it's six months to 24 months, where you want to be, and then reverse engineer all the steps necessary to get there very mindful that if things are going well, you want to continue. But if things are not working the way you expected, uh, sure, there might be some frustration there. Don't ignore it. But quickly turn around to say, okay, I learned from that. I'm going to go a different direction. I'm going to try something new in sales, marketing, product development, whatever it takes to move forward, always thinking about where you want to be next. So I, I definitely agree. Excellent. So now let's go back to uncertain times and being concerned about what is the right thing to do? What should I do? How should I be moving forward? Let's talk about skill set. That's actually one of my favorite things. I think that uh, it was Tony Robbins who said that, that most businesses have a lack of growth because they are missing a particular skill set. When we now take this concept of uncertainty and put it in skill set, where do you think is the issue for business owner in the context of they want to grow authority, they want to scale their impact, they want to make more money, they want to help more people, they want to have better lives, but they feel uncertain. What is it the skill set that they should be working on right now? I see two fundamental skills that all business leaders should think about on a recurring basis. One is how to develop yourself to be the most uh, effective and efficient in the business you're trying to run. And the second is fundamental planning skills, really thinking about ways that the company could go in this direction or that direction and the steps needed to accommodate whether you go up or down, how to adjust. 
So I'm going to pause there and see where. where yeah, let's go. let's be a little bit specific. Why don't we talk a little bit about skill sets as it pertains to sales? Because I believe that's probably one of the. I mean, it's one of the largest problem every business has: more clients, more sales. I remember very fondly when somebody said to me, "You know, I don't really need you to tell me anything about anything. Just tell me how to make more sales." That's all I need to know from you. But it's really a series of 100 things that you need to make more sales. If I'm not making enough sales right now, what is the skill set I should be honing in right now? So I would say that the first thing I would do in talking with the business leader is really understand the target audience, make sure you identified them and make sure you're talking to them. Uh, of course, there can be surveys, uh, but I really encourage leaders to go directly, talk to the customers. I love to ask what is it you're using our product or service for? What benefit are you getting out of it? Is it helping you save cost, efficiency? What other ways are you really looking to grow your business? And how can our product or service be helpful in that? And I take that information to come back and recalibrate. And then the second thing I would recommend after that is building a robust process where you're very clear how you're going to pursue your future customer audience and how you're going to identify the ones that fit well based on your existing customers, bring those new ones into the fold with a very clear process. And as you're running that process, you're running experiments at the same time, you're learning, you're figuring things out, you're understanding what's working, what's not, you can adapt, but you have to start with a set process to then be able to adapt. I like this idea, set a, set a process and then experiment. Can we dive into this just a little bit deeper uh, to understand exactly what does that mean? If I have a concept, so that's a theory that I have where I say I am designing a particular product or a particular service and I make assumptions, correct? That I believe that this particular group is having this particular problem, which is why I, I do this product. Is this my a correct understanding or is there anything you want to add to that? So when I talk about running experiments, it, it takes us back for most of us to high school and really coming out with a hypothesis. What do you expect to happen? Uh, the behaviors, the results, and then the outcomes. And by outcomes, I mean the impact on your customer's business and the impact on your own business. So what do you expect to happen? The activities or behaviors, the results and the outcomes. You lay that out before you run the experiment, then you mitigate the risk by putting some resources into that experiment, but not a lot. Then you come back and measure the results based on the data available. And with those results, you look at, okay, this worked well, let's do more of it. Oh, this did not really work well. Do we have to adjust our experiment or do we have to put that experiment to the side and try a new experiment because we really want to shake things up? Do you have like an, an example that you can share so we can bring this to life? Sure. So uh, the example I'm thinking of is uh, working with a customer uh, that has responded. How do I say this? So the client was really experiencing a lot of organic growth. Their existing customers kept growing, but they had a very hard time finding new customers. So the client had to take a step back and think about their ideal customer profile. They had to say, okay, what are the demographics, the type of company? the position of the buyers, look at all those different categories. And then they said, okay, of all the new deals that have come in the last 24 months, where are we seeing consistent patterns? Is it a certain type of buyer? Is it a certain region or demographic? Uh, definitely types of industries where we're finding success. Based on that information and what worked, let's run a new nurture campaigns on those specific audiences. Let's see if that continues to work as well as expected. Uh, and then based on that, let's go even further, run additional campaigns or, or hyper-focus the nurture campaigns. But what happened in the big picture is they went from a reactive stance of, oh, it's nice that our, our customers are growing, so therefore we're growing, to a proactive stance of what is it about our customers that's really working? What is the specific persona we should be looking at? What type of marketing campaigns are really reaching them? What type of sales presentations are closing deals? Excellent. So it is making an assumption and then going in, having actual conversations, testing the assumptions, and then also being prepared of allowing yourself to be wrong or be maybe a little bit right and, uh, and open to constantly adjusting. Do you find that business owners are often 
very attached to look at things from what they know and not open to changes in the market? How do you address that? So yes, and it's funny. First, I'll say that all of us as humans uh, become attached to what's worked for us. Um, But particularly in talking with founders, and you've probably seen this too, there are founders who do a fantastic job getting from almost zero dollars to their first million or a couple million. And there's a certain skill set that needs to be applied in order to lift the company off the ground. But then at a certain point, if you want to go from a few million to tens of millions, you have to have a completely different skill set as a leader. Now, some leaders recognize that right away and they step aside. They say, I want to be you know, the CTO or I want to be the uh, president of the company who's really focused on sales, but somebody else can be the CEO. But most founders are enamored by their own success. It's hard not to be, right? We have all these people telling us how great we are. Maybe we had a, a successful fundraise. You know, Maybe we had a lot of revenue growth, so that's great for our ego. And it's hard to stop and say, yes, this got me to a very successful point in the business's journey. But now in order to continue that journey, I have to take on a very different skill set as a leader in this company. And I have to be open to what worked yesterday, uh, hyperactivity, delegation, constantly talking with everybody on the team is not going to be an effective strategy in order to reach the next milestone where I'm going to have to delegate, put in processes in lieu of conversations all the time and really think about a data-driven approach to grow the business much further. I think that that is a very simplistic and easy way to look at this from the perspective of what are we trying to achieve? And every time you get to a particular point that there's a next level in growth, I love this quote, Benjamin, what got you here isn't going to get you there. (laughs) Yes. I think that is very poignant in the way we do business. The skill set that got you to be a great salesperson isn't making you a great team leader, isn't making you a great operator or scaling expert. It means that you're good at sales and that's how you got all this stuff in, but it means that you have, you have blind spot. I want to talk to you now about the action set in times of uncertainty, and we're going to do this right after this quick message. Are you looking for the hidden opportunities for you in this market? Or are you simply wanting to figure out what is your unique differentiation factor that makes clients want to work with you and not your competitors? If this resonates, I want to invite you to go to uncoverysession.com and schedule your 15-minute complimentary uncovery session with one of our business growth advisors that will take you through what your number one business growth blocker is, what you can do to remove it, and what your very best next step should be. And now let's get back to the show. Thank you, Benjamin, for all these insights on the skill set and the mindset about how do we build, grow, and scale the company. And now I want to dive into you, into your insights into the action set. Aside from squirrels, which I know every entrepreneur, founder, business owner I have ever known loves to get distracted with, which is another idea is going to make something simpler or easier so that they don't have to dive into the minutia of certain things, a program that they might have bought. What's the right way to approach taking action to build a successful business in uncertain times? Yes. No, I appreciate the question. And I want to be very specific here because I have a feeling that's going to be useful for your audience. So let me come out with four very specific ideas. Uh, The first is taking the time to plan. There is another adage which says you need to spend time on the business, not constantly in the business. And that means every day setting aside uh, up to 15 minutes to think about what you want from every meeting and activity during your day. Uh, It means spending a couple hours every week thinking about what you want from the upcoming week. And it means spending half a day every month thinking about how you're going to grow your business, not cut up in all the emails and meetings. The second thing I love to talk to founders about is how to optimize your energy. All of us have different times of the day where we're most thoughtful and creative. And there are other times of the day where we might be a little sluggish, and that's a good time uh, to send out some emails or make a couple phone calls. But really think about your energy and how best to apply it. And that leans into the next two because it's around calendaring. One is setting time for deep work and for other projects and initiatives, which you highly value. 
One of the disconnects a lot of business leaders run into is they say A, B, and C are their priorities. And then you look at their calendar and you see it's inundated with lots of things which have nothing to do with those priorities. So you want to use your calendar as a tool to prioritize. And then finally, number four, you want to use your calendar as a to-do list. Everything that's important to you should be in your calendar. And those are personal items as well. But with the business, everything that's important should be in there. So if something else comes up or a squirrel runs by and you're tempted to change that existing meeting or appointment, you have to say to yourself, is it really worth it to move this existing meeting for that squirrel? And if so, maybe maybe that is a potential elephant and you want to make that transition, that's fine. You have to reschedule what was already in there because you're, you already told yourself that's highly important and you need to keep that on your calendar somewhere. I think you're addressing now something that I have noticed about myself and just about everybody else I know. And as I dive into a lot of the mindset work that I do and, and the teachings of gurus and, uh, and trainers, that seems to be a common theme. It is the, why do people have such a difficult time to put money making activities first? Yes, I, I totally agree. Uh, the analogy I've seen before is there are certain things you do with your work time that are worth $10 an hour, certain things worth $100 an hour, $1,000 an hour, even activities worth $10,000 an hour when it comes to engaging uh, new customers and uh, thinking about ways to partner and grow your business. So it's fascinating. We get we as humans uh, get caught up in these different distractions. It's tough when people at work, our stakeholders, our investors are asking us for different meetings or to look at other opportunities that matter to them but may not matter to us. And this is where I think it's really important for founders to get comfortable with something that I think is very uncomfortable, and that is the ability to say no. And I'm not saying to your audience, go out there and just say no all the time to everyone and not have anything else to say but no. But what I'm talking about is, is respectful reflection of what's important to you to growing your business. And if somebody is coming at you with uh, a distraction, something that might be important to them, but is going to take you off your track, you really want to think, is that activity, even if it's six months out, you want to sit there and say, if I were to do that tomorrow, would that really help me grow my business? And would that support my customers and my team and what I'm trying to accomplish? And if the answer is no, you come back to them and say, hey, I'm sorry, I'm not really going to be able to help you out with this. If it's possible, you can recommend other people who can help them or other activities. Uh, now we all have access to ChatGBT. You might be able to look up there and with your knowledge and with that answer, be able to direct them to some great alternatives. But we do have to find our way to say no more often in order to stay focused on what's important. Yes, I, you, you you touched on so many different things here. So I want to break this down a little bit further for our beehive. So number one, what I heard you say is there has to be a clarity about what the value of your time is and the value that you are providing in what you're working on in your business right now. I had, uh, as you were saying that, I was thinking about we are now uh, changing our video editing for the uh, audio version of this podcast because we felt that the technology that was used or the way it was presented, the graphics just wasn't as enticing. And when you were talking, I'm thinking to myself, well, I have to set up the process for that. I have to find somebody. I have to approve the, the pattern or, or what it's going to be done in the process. You know, what uh, AI tool we're using to extract the information from the podcast for the show notes and things like that. What's your dollar amount for that? And then I had a sudden pit in my stomach because I'm going, well, my best time spent is, of course, always to be on the phone and to uh, to contact people, to talk to people, to make phone calls, to check in with the existing clients. How do we reconcile these pieces of things that we need to do to create a process for our business that do take time but don't have an immediate payoff and the money making activity that we should be always putting first? to drive our business forwards because we are going to need the processes to at some point when we make all the sales. So what's your advice on that, Benjamin? So I appreciate uh, the conversation and bringing it very much back to what we're doing now as an example for the audience. 
So I, the way I would look at it is uh, three different ways. One is how can uh, these podcasts really uh, support your existing and potential customers? Uh, that is, you know, reaching out to people, asking them perhaps open-ended questions about, tell me about your favorite podcast recently. Uh, tell me something you've learned from the podcast. Tell me about how it's helped you. And if you find your customers or prospects are struggling to come up with answers, that's also telling as well. Perhaps it's not engaging them the way that we would like, but I believe it is, but we always want to test our assumptions. That's what makes us great leaders. Uh, the second is you uh, talked about the business goals and you want to be very mindful that the podcasts are aligned with your financial goals. And then the third is a baseline around profitability. You know, even if you're hitting the first two marks, if your investment in the podcast is so far uh, that it's, it's putting you in an uncomfortable position with the rest of the business, you'd have to reassess, are there ways to streamline expenses? Are there upfront expenses, which are going to level out as you're doing more? Or is it something that's just never going to work for the business, even if there is value? And so therefore, how do you pivot and continue to create value in other ways? I think that's a good way to way to look at it. So you said that you come in oftentimes as a fractional CFO or fractional COO. And you help companies figure this out. Is that what it looks like in the real world? Is that somebody like you comes in and then you, let's say, to stay with the example, you'd look at the podcast. What would be the questions that you'd ask me? So with the podcast, I would start by asking you, what is the reason you started the podcast? How does the podcast fit into your vision, your values, really the problem you're trying to solve? And that I know that is keeping you up all the time, thinking about how to best serve your customers. How does the podcast been really pursuing those? What are ways that you think it's very effective and what are ways that you think it's struggling? Uh, I always like to see if business leaders have a sense of both the good and the bad. Most of us as humans are weighted on one of those and not the other. So I like to see if somebody's leveled it out or if they're missing items in one of the columns because their perspective is overly optimistic or overly pessimistic. From there, I'd get into the financial side and say, okay, these are your goals. This is what you talked about you're looking to accomplish. This is what I'm seeing from the finances around the podcast and the rest of the business. You know, If there is a long-term value add or brand building that I'm missing, which is harder to put a number behind financially, of course, but you say, no, this is really serving a purpose for me. It's allowing me to meet other thought leaders in the business and better serve my customers. And it's hard to put a dollar amount on that, but I know there is value. Great. You know, let's have that conversation. And then, of course, you know, we look at the pure numbers and say, OK, is this really an important part of the business? And is it, you know, uh, financially uh, viable with the rest of your cash flow and growth plans? Excellent. I think this is going to give our audience a very, very good insight into mindset, skill set, action set and finance in uh uncertain times for your business. For somebody who's now heard about what you do, Benjamin, where should we send them? Where can they find out more about you? Sure. Well, people can always start on my website. It's www.webuildscalegrow.com. Uh, there are standing material in there as well as constantly updated posts. I also have a strong presence on LinkedIn under my own name, Benjamin Friedman. And I also send out a newsletter weekly. People can sign up through either of those avenues. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. I really thank you for your time. All right. Thank you so much. I've had a great time here as well. Thank you. And that's it for us today. Thank you so much for listening or watching. Don't forget to share this podcast with one other person that needs to hear what we talked about today. And until next time and goodbye. Thank you for listening to or watching the show. We are so excited that you're here and we are very grateful for you. Now it's our turn to ask you for help. Please do share this episode with one other person that needs to hear what we were talking about today. If there's any question you have about business, please do reach out to us and let us know. And don't forget to schedule your complimentary Uncovery Session at UncoverySession.com, where one of our business growth advisors will help you to figure out what your number one business growth blocker is in only 15 minutes. And that's it for us today. Until next time.